listening and say, Rachel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll monitor any of the Q&A and give you heads up when we're getting close to the end. Excellent, wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for joining me today. Uh, my name is Rachel Brooks, and I am the coordinator of the Office of eLearning at North Carolina Central University. I also have the pleasure of serving as the co-chair for the University of North Carolina System Quality Matters Council. Um, and so I am co-lead QMC for uh, the UNC system. So today I am sharing with you all a presentation uh, that I actually put together with a few of my coworkers in the Division of Extended Studies and had shared that you know, these resources um, were well received in other areas and we felt that this would be something worthwhile to share with the QM community. Um, and this, this session is entitled, Y'all Means All. <laughs> okay, so we're from the South. <laughs> Y'all means all, we mean everyone. And so we're gonna be looking at NCCU's holistic approach to supporting our online learners, recognizing that we have a variety of online students coming to us and we wanna make sure that we are structuring our support network and our systems to encourage um, our learners as they are going through the process from the very beginning all the way uh, through their matriculation and then uh, subsequent uh, job placement or advancement in their fields. <clears throat> so uh, we have a few session objectives. We're going to take a look at some of the tools that are available to prepare students for online learning. Um, we're going to discuss what happens when you restructure your campus uh, to help support online learners. So how can we utilize the resources that we have present to better support our online learners? Uh, in doing so, we're going to identify potential offices and persons with whom we can collaborate to create these networks of support. We're going to identify uh, a number of practices that we might already be incorporating and we're going to share uh, how we are already on our campuses supporting our learners and see what we can learn from one another, as well as integrate a number of support elements throughout the course shell um, and in our course delivery to support our online learners. So just taking a look at where we are today. Um, it's important to note, and I wanted to kind of highlight what the picture looks like in the state of North Carolina, particularly within the UNC system. So um, where we are today, we have 4.8 million underserved learners in North Carolina. And what we're talking about as far as this number, where this came from, is that we're referring to adults under the age of 55 that do not have an undergraduate degree, 4.8 million of them. And um, we recognize that in our online classes, we can have a mix of students. Yes, we may have some who are coming, our Gen Zers who are coming straight from high school or maybe have been removed from high school just a few years to our millennials that are currently between the ages of 28, let me say 26 to about 38. <clears throat> our Gen Xers, as well as our baby boomers. And so our online courses and our online programs include a number of students with different perspectives, different life experiences, and we want to make sure that we are addressing their needs. Some of the barriers though that we're facing as far as growing our online programs is that many of our institutions have inflexible policies or practices. Um, that may not necessarily align with even good policies. We have different um, operational processes that are not conducive to supporting fully online programs or online learners, as well as limited funding and resources. And there was, at least within the state of North Carolina, there was a lack of a system-wide approach to supporting online learners. So <clears throat> this is a quote I'm not going to read it directly, um, but this is a quote from our UNC Digital Learning Initiative, one of the strategic recommendations for online programs. And so it focuses on this disconnect between the demand for um, the demand and online enrollment and the policies 
that should be designed for our working adults. They didn't actually line up. And so on the system level, and let me share, our University of North Carolina system is composed of 17 schools, one of which is North Carolina Central University, which is a historically black university. Um, but at the system level, amongst the, the 17 institutions, we did not have a system-wide approach um, for meeting the needs of our you know, our, our students and, and this demand um, for online enrollment. And then the needs of our working adults, the needs of our students, um, as well as an investment in the marketing and student enrollment processes. It just wasn't there. So at NCCU, what we decided to do is we really made a point to make sure that we were aligned with our university strategic plan dealing with, for example, goal one, student access and success. And so we talk about how NCCU will deliver on the Eagle Promise to increase student access and success. We wanted to make sure that we were increasing community college partnerships, providing um, paths to completion, degree completion for partway home students, as well as institutional sustainability. So ensuring that we are incorporating best practices in the delivery of our courses, a system-wide approach for supporting our faculty, and creating a culture of recognition for our faculty. So um, for those of you who might have joined me earlier this morning, you've seen something similar to this, and I'm glad you do because it shows alignment <laughs> with what we are doing, how all of the decisions that we are making, making are driven by the expectations for our institution and our various programs, of course, aligning with SAC COC. But here, we focus not only on um, the standard 6.5, which deals with faculty development, 10.4, which focuses on academic governance. So it's the expectation that the quality and the, um, the, the, content that's provided within these courses are the responsibility of the faculty member. And so our office, the Office of E-Learning, is designed to help faculty in meeting those expectations. But then also 10.6, dealing with distance and correspondence education. So we wanted to make sure all we were doing was aligned with those expectations that we needed to uphold. So um, keeping in mind, <clears throat> Our online learners, again, they represent a variety of generations. Many of them are employed while they are taking online courses. Okay, so we need to keep in mind that these are not necessarily just individuals who you know, are taking online classes because they have nothing else to do, but they're doing it for a reason while also maintaining a variety of responsibilities um, and those have been exacerbated because of this current pandemic that we're facing. And what does it mean to be now, for a lot of our students, forcibly placed in the online learning environment just to continue their educations, despite the other responsibilities that they have and the other concerns that they have? Um, and so many of our online classes prior to COVID-19 Many of our online classes were actually filled, the rosters were filled with students who were taking online courses, but were actually what we would consider on the ground uh, students or residential students, that they were not necessarily enrolled in fully online programs, but that they were taking online courses to help, for example, minimize time to degree or to help them develop skills um, that they need to be able to progress in their degrees or even just to help them advance um, a little bit faster than uh, you know, originally scheduled. All right, oops, let's go back. <clears throat> okay. So um, again, you know, we had to think about what do our learners need, all right? Uh, they need to make sure that they have programs and services and courses that are tailored to fit these needs that they're bringing to us that we have these programs that are able to be modified, that they can be customized in ways um, that support our, our students. And so, for example, we may have fully, fully online degree programs, 
but then we can create certificate programs that are uh, incorporating a number of courses that students can take from the fully on or the fully uh, online degree programs to create a certificate. But then if they chose to pursue the full degree, they could build on that. So we want to look at ways in which we can be agile in the type of curriculum that we offer and the pathways um, to, to students, meaning what they determine are their levels of success. So it's very important that we listen to the needs of our learners and that we're willing to respond to those in a very specific way. So we have um, our division of extended studies, and I'm actually going to go ahead and have this entirely on the screen for you to see. <clears throat> but our division of extended studies took a step back and decided, okay, how can we be much more intentional in making sure we're meeting the needs of our learners? Who are our DE learners? And so what we recognized is we needed to begin by being involved in the process from the start. So when we talk about uh, the initial stages of inquiry, when our students are prospective students, we need to be there. So we created, and you'll see as we go along in just a bit, we created mechanisms to make sure that we were constantly in contact with our learners, that they had student support specialists who were able to check in and say, hey, I see that you're interested uh, in this online program at North Carolina Central University. Um, I'd love to talk with you more about this, just to capture their attention. Uh, we took over the admissions process. And so our admissions process for our fully online courses, uh, as well as our site-based courses, any course that fell under our, our distance education programs, originally would go to, for example, undergraduate admissions or graduate admissions. And we recognize that having that intermediary by going through admissions actually slowed down the process and it created a breakdown of sorts because undergraduate admissions was being overwhelmed with having to contact our on the ground students as well as our online students. And so we had them come and train our staff to be able to take over the admissions process. And so now everything that's associated with what we're referring to as NCCU Online happens within NCCU Online. You will see in just a bit how we took over and revamped our advisement model. We work with the students through the enrollment process, throughout their, matric their matriculation. We make sure and we have mechanisms in place that you'll see in just a bit to help retain students to keep that pulse to find out how they are progressing, what supports they need to ensure that they in fact do graduate or complete their various programs. So as I had shared, um, <clears throat> we do provide distance learner support through collaboration. So our DE staff are the first persons with whom our students are um, in contact. So they are the one who we have individuals who are representatives of these different programs and so our staff are the ones who the students hear from first we have um, the staff includes our student support specialists our online admissions officers our academic advisors as well as our counselors and so students receive or prior to being students our applicants receive prompt inquiry responses. And so we have partnered um, with Blackboard to have our system set up where um, a student who, when they go to our website or they see an ad um, and they select a, a link to inquire more, to learn more about the program, we have it set up with Blackboard um, for us to receive a notification. And so we have a team, a dedicated team, our director of Division of Extended Studies partnered with Blackboard to have a dedicated team of individuals to understand what our process is um, for engaging students. And so we have individuals who will receive a phone call or will contact the students as representatives of NCCU um, just to help us manage that flow. And as they go through some preliminary information acquisition, they will then forward that to our student support specialists who will continue to reach out to students. 
And so there's this very intentional approach for making sure that those, even who are just identifying that they're interested in a program, know that we see them, that we are excited about bringing them in, and that they have support from the very beginning. So our DE coordinators, representative of the, the different programs, will then review the application documents, and they are the ones, they have been empowered by their programs to make admissions decisions. And it's important to note that these DE coordinators originally, now we're notorious for, we, we've been known to, to steal faculty <laughs> in a sense, but our high-flying faculty, these exceptional educators in these different fields, we have paid for positions for them to be our DE coordinators. And so many of them still teach within their units, but these were the ones who were originally providing support in making those admissions decisions. And so they have been empowered by their units to make these admissions decisions for these fully online programs. And as I had shared, our prospective distance learners receive hand-on support, resources, reassurance, and encouragement when they need it throughout the process. Okay, so um, very shortly, we're going to uh, check in with the chat in just a bit to see if there are any questions that we that I can address on uh, some of this preliminary information before we dig a little bit deeper. But first, I want to emphasize how we approached uh, learner support. And we did so looking specifically at the Quality Matters Higher Education rubric, the sixth edition, General Standard 7, focusing on technical support, academic support, student support and accessibility services. And so these are some questions that I want you to keep in mind as you're thinking about how are you supporting your learners? These are the questions that we pose specifically, I mean directly to our faculty. So making sure that they are providing instructions that link to those clear descriptions of the technical support that's offered. Do they provide a link to our university's accessibility policy? Does your university have an accessibility policy? And do you link to it as well as the services? And so our faculty know because we do have that policy, they have to go a little bit further than just having that syllabus statement, but they should also have a link to the accessibility services. And there are some other considerations um, because of the existence of that policy that our faculty must have in place to ensure that their courses support our diverse learners. You know, can learners easily identify and locate those academic support services um, and resources as well as student support services and resources? <clears throat> so um, as far as technical support, we want to make sure that you're including information on how to contact the help desk, making sure that you provide uh, contact information for email addresses, websites, technical support, where they can submit, for example, um, help tickets if necessary, or to receive um, assistance in using the different tools. We let our faculty know that we don't expect you to be tech support, but you must do your due diligence to make sure you provide your learners the technical support that they need to be successful in your course. But there are head starts that you can provide to your students. And some of those include providing links to tutorials. Again, you are not expected to be technical support unless that is your subject matter expertise, but at least provide links to tutorials, guides, videos that your learners can use. And on our campus, we had created a best practice template that is populated with some of the most commonly used support tools and resources so that faculty can just make it available to their learners and add to it if necessary. And then again, you also want to make sure that you're providing links to web resources that support the development of technical skills. So let your learners know what they should be able to do um, to be successful as far as utilizing technology in the course, but then don't let that be a deal breaker for them. If they don't have the skills, make sure you provide links to tutorials to help them develop those skills so that they are prepared to engage in online learning. So one of the resources I love, our NCCU online website um, <clears throat> includes this online readiness self-assessment. And this is an example of, well, this is the actual online readiness self-assessment. I will make sure for those of you who, um, those of you who have access, who have accessed this PowerPoint um, in the resources, 
I hyperlinked that image that you saw on the slide to take you to this web page. So you, you should be able to access that pretty easily, but let me know if you have trouble. The online readiness assessment, though, allows students to check you know, the different radio buttons, columns A and B, to make the determination about whether or not they are ready to engage in online learning. Are they ready to engage or are they not yet ready to engage? And what I love about this is, let's just quickly go through, we'll say, yes, we feel good about this, we'll do that, not quite happy about it. Um, I say we feel good about that. I have difficulty setting goals and meeting deadlines. This is very helpful for us to know as we are trying to determine how we can support students and how students can self-assess their um, executive functioning skills. Are they able to manage goals and to work toward meeting those deadlines? So let's go ahead and just go. Whew. It provides them a number of considerations, okay? And I love the way in which we frame this. So either, yes, I am ready for online learning or I may need a little more preparation. So we do not outright tell students, no, you are not ready for online learning. This is not for you. We let them know that there are some additional tools and strategies that they might want to take into consideration to help them prepare. And as you see at the very bottom, there are links to different resources that they can use to assist them in their preparation for engaging in online learning. All right. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> in addition to that resource, we also provide within our learning management system, we are a Blackboard institution, there is a Blackboard student orientation. Our University of North Carolina system has provided an online learning 101 lesson for our institutions to reference um, as our students are asking for resources to use in their preparation for online learning. And then the Goodwill Community Foundation also provides a wealth of resources, typing games, internet basics um, that can be used to support readiness for online learning. And so each of these, this is just an example of the inside of that Blackboard student orientation shell. Students are automatically added to this shell once they have been granted access to Blackboard. Uh, additionally, let's see if I can pull that down. There we go. This is the online learning 101 for, um, created by the University of North Carolina system. And so students can, you can actually access this from um, the link that is provided in the document and you can peruse through this and see, uh, let's see, for prospective students. <clears throat> and you can go through, again, completing a pre-assessment and you can go through and actually check that out. Uh, and then as I had shared, the Goodwill Community Foundation, GCF Global, provides a number of excellent resources and strategies. So for example, technology where each of these are linked to different tutorials and resources that students can use to assist them in becoming acclimated to the online learning environment. So we encourage our faculty to provide those resources and those, again, are populated within this, this template that we have created for our faculty. So I am curious, if you would, in the Q&A, um, Tell me, we're going to address some of the questions that may have already come up, but I'm also curious to know how does your institution prepare students for online learning? Let's see, Jim, do we have any questions in the Q&A? There's no questions in the Q&A. Some people okay. have been putting some things in the chat. Uh, okay. Nice, same as our LMS. What I really appreciate is the systematic approach rather than the piecemeal approach used in many institutions. Thank you. Yes, and please feel free to borrow. <laughs> we believe in sharing. Um, uh, how, how are some of you already preparing your students for online learning? Uh, one comment was in a pretty disjointed manner so far. Hope to use more of the ideas you have implemented. Okay. Nice. Another All one. Right. 
Do you see the other one that says, I do not think that our institution does anything formally, actually. Oh, no. Okay. No, we need to talk. <laughs> well, please feel free to share this with them. You're more than welcome to use this and any public facing materials. I encourage you. Uh, to incorporate to support your learners. I did not include everything that we do in this presentation and you'll see that there may be some other things that I referenced. So if, uh, as I'm talking, if you hear something comes up and, and you know, you did not see it in the presentation itself and you would like it, please just feel free to reach out to me. I'll make sure you get that. All right, so in the, uh, in consideration of time, we're gonna go ahead and move forward and there will be some other opportunities for us to address questions. So one of the areas that we also talk about is accessibility support. And I want you to keep in mind these figures. 13% of public school students receive special education or receive special education services in 2016. Now of those, 34% of those services were related to specific learning disability. The problem, however, is that only 2.5% 38% of undergraduate students enrolled in two and four year Title IV degree granting post-secondary institutions formally registered with their offices of student accessibility services. And this tells us that we may have a number of students who are sitting in our classes or enrolled in our online courses who have varying degrees of learning disabilities or um, uh learning considerations or may need certain accommodations to help them fully engage in the online learning environment who have not self-disclosed now not only do they need to report and uh self-disclose to their office their respective office of, of student accessibility services but they must do so at the beginning of every term, they must re-register because accommodations change. Sometimes students need less accommodations. Other times students need more accommodations. And so accommodations do not roll over. They are not retroactive, at least at, at North Carolina Central University, <laughs> they are not. Um, and so it's helpful and it's important to open a dialogue with your learners from the very beginning, letting them know the resources that are available to them in a very tactful way. You can't just come out and say, hey, you know, I see you've been struggling. I think you have a learning disability. What you could do is pose the question, for example, or provide resources that can support learners. So you can still say, I've noticed that, you know, you've been having difficulty um, or you've expressed difficulty in engaging in you know, this manner. There are a number of resources available through our campus that may support you. We have the Writing Center, we have Tutoring Center, Student uh, Disability Services or uh, Student Accessibility Services. We have the Counseling Center. Do you think any of those resources may be able to assist you? You know, so open the conversation and let your learners know. We actually encourage our faculty uh, within your syllabi if you, when you place your syllabus statement explaining the accessibility services that are available, we ask faculty to also include a statement letting learners know that if they receive accommodations, the faculty member will receive on our campus, we use the accommodate system. So when a student has been determined to receive accommodations by our Office of Student Accessibility Services, the faculty member receives an automated message from the Accommodate system that lets them know a student in their course and who that student is, is to receive these specific accommodations. So the faculty member is notified, but we encourage faculty to let their learners know that they are welcome to have a discussion about the accommodations that the student has been assigned and what those look like in that particular course. Because even though a student receives accommodations, it's their decision on how and if they choose to utilize those accommodations in the course. And so it's important to have that open dialogue and have that conversation with your students so that they understand what does this look like in the course and what are the expectations. And if there are faculty who are unfamiliar with how to provide certain types of accommodations, they should know the resources and the support services on their campus to assist them in offering them. So um, again, you wanna make sure that you provide a link to your institutional accessibility policy. Um, you want to make sure that you provide accessibility statements for all tools. So just as much as you are not tech support, 
you're also not the accessibility team <laughs> for your course and that's fine but make sure if you are using a third party tool if you're using an e-textbook if you are using some type of software that you're also providing an accessibility statement so that your learners are able to receive the support that they need when they need it also if you know that there are accessibility features within your course let your learners know that they exist many students are not aware that closed captioning is available on certain videos or how to activate that so provide guidance on the features that are available as well as how learners can use them and again make sure that you are openly identifying your willingness to discuss accommodations with your learners so when we train our faculty um, we are we're a small team <laughs> we are a team of two uh, i'm the coordinator of the office i have a senior instructional designer we are in essence the instructional designers for our campus and um we have a campus of about 700 faculty and we work not only with our faculty who teach only online courses we support all of our faculty and we provide guidance on the use of technology um, in the development and instruction of all courses and so we are um, and we're actually leading the charge as far as digital accessibility on our campus and so what we've recognized just from sheer necessity is that we need to empower faculty but the way that you empower faculty to make change or at least what we have found is to have it resonate with them we need to make sure that we're tapping in to their motivation okay um this this uh we talked about this three-dimensional model of learning and this incentive dimension what incentivizes faculty to actually incorporate best practices as it relates to digital accessibility and one way to do that is to provide them an opportunity to empathize with their learners and to understand what they may be bringing to the table so this is just an example i'm not going to press the video for the sake of time but this is an example of one way in which we engage faculty and we talk about visual impairments as it relates to colorblindness and how prevalent it is and why it's important not to rely on color alone to add emphasis and how that might be problematic for learners we also incorporate there's another one of dyslexia assessment where it provides uh, two paragraphs that are demonstrated there's a very short lesson on how persons with dyslexia may experience reading content especially in a timed environment and so it's uh, two paragraphs that are presented in a way in which a person with dyslexia may visualize text and they are timed with 60 seconds and we encourage them to read aloud as a group we say as a family and um they have to try to read the paragraph as well as immediately after the 60 seconds we test their comprehension and it's amazing to see the reactions where faculty for many of them for the first time are actually truly internalizing the strength of what it means to support digital accessibility and why it's so important and how they may have learners in their courses who although they do not have accommodations documented may still be experiencing challenges in accessing the course and why it's so important to incorporate universal design to meet their needs and those of other students so again we do focus on general standards seven um, as well as general standard eight we take digital accessibility very seriously on our campus and so we encourage faculty to ensure that they are also meeting the various specific review standards that are found in general standard eight dealing with making sure their course navigation supports ease of use the design supports readability making sure they have accessible documents and learning management system pages our lms the blackboard system in and of itself is pretty accessible but you know as you start adding more content to it it can change um it can change the quality um, of accessibility of it and so we want to make sure they know how to do that responsibly making sure they're providing alternative means for multimedia <clears throat> and um does the multimedia facilitate ease of use as well as again in providing those vendor accessibility statements so um there are a number of uh, policies that go into making sure that our our courses are accessible um, 
I will briefly touch on these. We do as an institution work to make sure that we are meeting expectations as it relates to um, the Americans with Disabilities Act, as well as the Amendment Act, um, sections 504 and 508 of the Rehabilitation Act, as well as its, their amendments focusing on, specifically on the use of technology, the QM Higher Education rubric, as you saw, um, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, our institutional web standards and procedures, as well as our North Carolina General Statute 168A-7, which refers to the fact that it is a discriminatory practice for a governmental institution to deny access to persons um, because of a disability to any services or programs. And you know, as a state institution, we definitely fall under that category. Um, but it's just a good practice, and it's just it's goodwill to make sure that we are making our content, our resources, our programs, and our services available to all who are, um, who are qualified uh, and interested in accessing them. <clears throat> so one way in which we've done that is the, as I had shared earlier, the development of our university uh, policy, our accessibility policy for course design. And so we spent about a year, and it was actually born from the first cohort of faculty who were preparing uh, our courses for QM certification. When we got to that standard asking for our university accessibility policy, everyone kind of looked around the room and we we're like, oh yeah, the syllabus statement, right? And then we looked at the annotation and we were like, oh no, that's, that's not what that means. Um, and so we realized that we did not have an accessibility policy. So we did our research and we found that many institutions actually developed their accessibility policies as a result of litigation. Um, and so we wanted to kind of get ahead <laughs> and we did not want to be reactionary. We wanted to be proactive. And so we spent a year of conducting focus groups, meeting with different stakeholders, putting together this accessibility policy, working with our university council, um, our legal counsel in creating multiple drafts. And um, we put together this accessibility policy for online course design that is linked in the documents and you're welcome to take a look at that. Please use it if you would like to um, develop one for your institution or revisit what, um, what yours may already look like and see if there's anything you wanna add to it. And it was approved by, uh, we presented it to our Board of Trustees and it was unanimously approved the very next day. And so from that time moving forward, we invested in an aggressive training, <laughs> aggressive training, um, to make sure that our faculty were aware of the accessibility policy as well as had the resources necessary to ensure that it was in fact present in their courses. So, I am uh, going to pause for just a bit because I would like to know what are some of the strategies that your institutions are using to promote an inclusive environment for your online learners? Um, what are the strategies? And then maybe what even are some of the challenges that you're facing in meeting their needs? waiting for people to type some information into the chat. Not a problem. You have about 11 minutes. Thank you. Let's see, can you tell if we have any coming in or? I don't see if anyone's typing away. Okay. The well, number that's of participants, but uh, <laughs> you know, not typing in. That's just okay. So maybe they're quiet after after lunch. Perfectly fine. Look and see. I'm I'm catching you all right after lunch. <laughs> yes. So keep those thoughts in mind. We will have a quick Q and A at the end just to check and see if there's any culminating ideas and thoughts that you might uh, would like to address at that time. Um, but we will move forward so that we can make sure that we finish on time. So, how might you support your diverse learners? Um, we encourage our faculty to make sure that all of their content is accessible. Don't wait until you have a student who requires accommodation, but start incorporating, as you see at the bottom, universal design for learning principles to ensure that all of the digital content that you provide is in fact accessible. And it's beneficial as you're communicating with your colleagues as well. Um, many of us with 
in the field have a variety of, um, uh, of considerations that we need you know, accommodations for or may need support in accessing digital content. And so it's just a good practice all around. Uh, so be sure to provide accessible formats of content for your learners, especially those who are registered with your respective Office of Student Accessibility Services, but as much as possible, incorporate universal design for learning principles. Um, so I'm not going to go over all of this, but I encourage you to use the accessibility features if you are using Microsoft documents. Rather than using um, bold or italics, I know a lot of us, we will, um, let me see, hold on, I'm gonna pull up my Word document really quickly. Let's see what we have, I see. Okay, and pardon, my, <laughs> my computer is in Spanish. But, okay, so um, a lot of us will use, this would be a B, okay? So bold or uh, italics, it would be an I when we're typing. But instead of doing that, use the styles feature. Okay, so headings one, headings two, and you can right click and modify them to make them look the way that you want them to look. Okay, but we encourage you to do that because what happens is by utilizing the styles feature, this is what's actually communicating to screen readers to let students know that the content on the page is in fact bolded. So we're going to use strong or we're going to use emphasis. We're going to use headings because the headings allows our learners who are using screen reader software to actually scroll, to scroll through their documents uh, and to, to skim through the documents the same way we would do so visually. But if you use bold or italics, what happens is, yes, aesthetically, it looks as though it is bolded or it looks as though it is italicized, but that does not communicate to the screen readers that a person, uh, that a student may use. So instead, use strong. It still looks the same way, but includes that very important coding, uh, as well as emphasis, if you would like to italicize. Reserve underlining only for demonstrating navigation, meaning you know it's going to take you to a web page or it's going to perform some type of function. Uh, unless your style guide, and most of the style guides have been updated to appropriately address accessibility features, um, unless the style guide requires that you underline text, refrain from doing that if necessary and find another way to add emphasis. Um, similarly, <clears throat> You want to make sure that you are providing accessibility within your PDFs. Your PDFs should be selectable and searchable. You want to make sure that headings and uh, titles are formatted using styles. And you can verify that by using the bookmarks feature. And so within each of these types of documents, there are ways in which you can perform accessibility checks. Similarly, you want to perform accessibility checks on the websites that you are utilizing. So WebAIM includes this wonderful website where you can type in a web page address. I'm sorry, I'm going to put QM on the screen. So QMprogram.org. Okay, so we're going to go to the QM website and we can see how accessibility is displayed throughout. So we can see the different features, we can see any alerts, we can see the various structural elements that are present. So you get the details, as well as we can see that there are a variety of headings that are used. And this allows students who are utilizing screen readers to be able to skim through the page the same way we would do so visually. So we encourage you to, to incorporate um, those accessibility checks. Now, as far as universal design is concerned, make sure that you're simplifying your chord shell. You know, less is more. Make sure that it's organized in a modular structure and include a variety of supports, uh, resources and sources that address learners' learning preferences. And then you, again, want to make sure that you are providing alternative texts for your different images and your tables refrain from using color as a sole indicator or the only way in which you're adding emphasis or differentiating, used bulleted 
lists or ordered lists, as well as making sure that your hyperlink around your hyperlink text is meaningful. So rather than having an entire URL or web address, simplify it and make sure you can hyperlink the text within your document. Now I would like to quickly touch on promoting online neurodiversity and inclusion. And so when we talk about supporting our learners, our diverse learners, it's often focusing on learners that might have various hearing impairments or visual impairments, but we also want to make sure that we are supporting learners who may have difficulty with um, organizing their work or staying on task or setting goals. So learners who may be experiencing varying degrees of autism or ADHD, um, you can support them by establishing predictability and structure. So just like we were talking about those universal design principles, they support a variety of learners. Um, posting calendars, scaffolding your assignment instructions, breaking your content down into manageable chunks so that students can easily work through them and provide those check-ins, those checkpoints for students to be able to ensure that they are staying on track or they can modify their behaviors if necessary to support them meeting their goals. Provide consistent feedback so that learners are aware um of their ability and their their success in staying on track providing opportunities for students to ask for assistance if necessary so that they can readjust um, how they might be approaching the work but then maybe how we as instructors can readjust how we are delivering content and supporting our learners and then again providing various ways in which you are addressing students multiple intelligences as well as their learning preferences and support autonomy. Give students an opportunity to take ownership in their learning. All right, so make sure you provide a variety of um, the, the list of academic support resources that are available to your learners. Let them know about institutionally approved tutoring services, for example, as well as different resources that they can <laughs> use. <laughs> different resources that they can use to support them as they progress Mom. through. So this is an example of some of, okay. this is um, an example of one, of one of the resources that we provide to our students, which is our upswing tutoring service that they can then register for and be able to receive assistance as needed. And then again, um, we, have, uh, we have tied in a way in which we've incorporated this advising model so that students know how they can receive support um, either through the online course 101, the Blackboard tutorial help desk, um, as well as virtual computing labs and information technology services. Um, and so I've touched on this briefly earlier, um, but our DE coordinators and our academic departments are ways in which students receive that constant support. So again, make sure you're establishing a network of support for your learners so that they know how they can get in touch with you as well as receive assistance through, um, during their matriculation throughout your program. <clears throat> and we have been intentional about making sure that we're employing analytics to inform the decisions. And so we're constantly checking in and assessing how these networks of support do in fact assist our learners and what can be improved. And so just like the academic support, you wanna provide student support resources for your learners. And on this one, here are some of the student support and academic support resources. So we created a digital campus essentially. And so we have individuals in each of these areas who have been brought on to assist our learners and learners know that depending on their needs, this is the individual with whom they can place themselves in contact to receive assistance. Okay. Um, You're so at almost at time, just to yes. let you know. Oh, We're good. right at the end. <laughs> We're right at the end. So um, that in a nutshell 
is what NCCU has done to support our learners and to make sure they are aware of the various mechanisms that are in place to assist them. Again, looking at it from a holistic approach and understanding that they don't just need... <laughs> My assistant would like some cookies and cupcakes. Um, but making sure that they understand what... Okay what resources are available to them to help them as they progress through their various programs. So I'm gonna go ahead, I know we are right at the end, but I may be able to address a question or two um, as we are in the process of transitioning to the next session. One person asked if uh, the link for colorblindness and dyslexia experience that you share with your instructors. Yes, so that link is available through the, um, that is hyperlinked in the presentation. presentation. Okay, and I posted that information uh, and it, it's available on our website. I'll post that again in a second. Okay. Um, the comments coming in, incredible, lots of uh, fabulous information. Thank you for your outstanding presentation. Awesome session, humanizing. My students have kids, pets, et cetera, during class. Yeah. So you've done a <laughs> great job of juggling. Um, Thank you so much. Look, I'm doing my best. <laughs> I think that is it. I'm going to stop the recording. Okay, thank you.